Welcome everybody to this ISOC SE day, the full day here at the uh, Internet Organa. Uh, we are very happy to have yet another of these ISOC SE days here with interesting panelists and of course very interesting and emerging issues we want to discuss with you. Uh, Internet, the world is changing and yeah, we had one day yesterday at Internet Organa and many interesting topics and many good sessions and of course very interesting keynote speakers both yesterday and today. So of course there are many issues that are of interest for us to discuss with you and our panelists. ISOC SE is the Swedish chapter of the Global Internet Society. I am the chair of ISOC SE and I have a few board members here as well. Nuran is one of them, I will present her in a moment. Uh, ISOC SE is our organization that's been around since 1997. Actually, I think it was the same time as at .se was created, the, the foundation um, of internet infrastructure. And of course, I guess when it was created, it was the Swedish internet pioneers creating it. And so many of them are still around in this organization. And if you want to know more about Isaac Essie, of course you can go to our website. But in the bag, the little bag that you got yesterday when you, when you registered, there's a little folder with some more information. And of course we would like you to read it and hopefully some of you who are not members of our organization would like to be that. And during the years, uh, and during the year we try to have different kind of events with different topics and we try to listen to the members actually what you want us to talk about. So we try to have this interaction, we would, we would like to have that and even increase this kind of interaction, have events that will fulfill your needs of discussions on emerging issues. But I would, I would now, uh, now try to move forward and introduce uh, Nurani Numpino, one of our board members in the isoc -SE board and she will talk about together with a panelist uh, of internet governance and bring up some of the emerging topics, both in, uh, national but especially international, as we have an international panel here today. So this session in the morning will be in English, and after lunch we move to, move to Swedish, of course. So, internet governance, and who is creating and who is shaping the future of the internet? I give the floor to Nurani. Thank you. And good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, it's good to see so many people here. Um, like Maria said, uh, I'm a member of uh, the ISOC SE board, the Swedish chapter of the Internet Society. I'm also head of outreach and communication at uh, Netnode. And I'm uh, leading this panel today. I'm very happy to see that we've got such fantastic speakers uh, who are all experts in their field. And um, we're going to talk about internet governance and try to decipher what internet governance is. Um, I'm hoping that it will be an interactive session, and I can see you there at the back as well. So, uh, what, I'm, what we're hoping to do here is to give you a little bit of a background first, uh, and then go into the real meat and, and discuss what are the issues on the table, what are the actual tensions. I think a lot of you who are involved in, it, in the internet in some way have seen headlines about... Uh, internet governance issues that are more or less, some of them a little bit more controversial than others. And what we'll do is we're going to try to go behind those headlines and, and see what that really means. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. So first of all, we've got um, Konstantinos Komaitis from uh, the Internet Society. Uh, and Konstantinos is a policy advisor at the Internet Society. He focuses primarily on the field of digital content and intellectual property. And before he joined ISOC, he was a senior lecturer at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, UK. We also have Fiona Alexander, who's policy, sorry, who is associate administrator at the NTIA, um, which is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration's Office of International Affairs. Uh, and to her left, we have Yari Arko, who's the chair of the IETF. The IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, so the organization, if you can call it that, that actually sets the standards uh, in the Internet. And he's also an expert of in, on Internet architecture with Ericsson Research in Finland. And he pretends to not speak Swedish, but I think he speaks a little bit. 
And then to our far left, we've got Jean-Jacques Sahel, who is the Vice President Europe of Global Stakeholder Engagement of ICANN, that most of you might be familiar with. Uh, and he came from Skype, Microsoft before, where he worked as Director EMEA, EMEA Policy and International Organizations. Um, and he was previously Skype's Director of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Europe, Middle East and Africa. And before that, he worked for the UK government as well as in the City of London. Uh, so before we dive in, I'm actually going to ask you all. Uh, so we're not going to have any long presentations, no long lectures. And we'll do an introduction, then I'm hoping to get a round of questions that we can throw at the panel, then they can all respond. Just very quickly, can you just give us a very quick introduction to your involvement in this internet governance thing? Thanks, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm very excited. It's my first time uh, in Stockholm, and uh, I have heard a lot about this event, and I know how much Sweden is very internet uh, savvy. You guys uh, are innovators. So the Internet Society, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is an organization that was established in 1992, and uh, it was established primarily for uh, providing the institutional home to the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is currently chaired by uh, Yari. Uh, so primarily, the focus of the Internet Society was mainly in, on technical issues. However, uh, over the years, the, the, the idea that the technical bits of the Internet and the policy bits of the Internet are quite separate uh, became... Uh, it, it became more and more evident that this is not the case, and there are increasingly intertwined. So over the past uh, few years, the Internet Society has increasingly uh, been involved in uh, policy matters. When it comes to the Internet, we have been actively participating uh, in the Internet Governance Forum, the IGF, which uh, we will talk about, and we also attended uh, the World Summit on Information Society back in 2003. Uh, and 2005, which set the tone for what we now call internet governance and uh, the multi-stakeholder environment, which uh, I suspect will, um, will be part of our discussion today. Uh, one of the things that the Internet Society seeks to do is uh, ensure that everybody gets access. Uh, and this is why we speak to all the stakeholders, we speak to governments, we speak to businesses and civil society groups, and of course we have this huge vested interest in the on the technology uh, of the internet. And we try to ensure that policies that come uh, at a national, regional and international level do not have a negative impact uh, on the internet. And I will stop here uh, and then we can uh, continue. Thanks. No. 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 It's just me that doesn't know how to work technology, which is ironic. Closer. Oh, okay, that would be it. Um, so uh, thanks again for the invitation to come at, to, from Narani and from my good friend Maria. It's always lovely to come and uh, it was a great um, reason to come to Sweden for the first time. So it's, uh, thank you for that and for taking the time out of the day here to come listen to us talk about internet governance and hopefully engage in some uh, 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 conversation amongst the group and everyone here. So um, I've been at NTIA about 14 years now. Uh, NTIA is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, so this is the first of many acronyms you're going to hear if you're familiar and new to this space, so we'll try to avoid that as well. Um, but NTIA has a couple of purposes. It's part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, so I work for the U.S. federal government. Um, and NTIA is uh, the primary advisor to the President of the United States on communications policy. So basically the Ministry of, of Communications there in the U.S. And there's a variety of things that we do um, in terms of spectrum management and uh, grants and broadband issues. Um, but the, my part of the office uh, works primarily on international issues and in particular on internet governance. So um, as I said, I've been there about 14 years and the, 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 the 
history that we're going to discuss here a little bit today and, and the issues of today, I've been involved with for the, um, since the beginning of the World Summit with, with Jean-Jacques and others, um, and helping shape and be involved and uh, perpetuating and growing what we like to call and refer to as the multi-stakeholder model. It's a term that um, I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with here in terms of how things work in, in Sweden as well. But really our perspective is that the best way to deal with internet policy issues is not having governments, as governments decide, a single government or multiple governments, but instead having all the stakeholders be involved in the system. We feel like it's the best way to actually develop internet standards, like the IETF works, but also the best way to develop policy. So I've spent um, my 14 years um, debating and arguing this, 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 this concept within the UN system, whether it was the World Summit on the Information Society, or at the ITU or other places, but also are very much in, um, involved in, in, in ICANN issues. Our office oversees uh, the US government's relationship with ICANN, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that later today as well, but we'll leave it at that and let the conversation get going. Good morning. Hold on. Yes? Okay. So, good morning. Um, very happy to be here. Thank you for, for having me here. Um, this is, I obviously spend a lot of my time in Sweden, but this is my first time at, at this particular conference, and I have to say that, that um, yesterday when I was following some of the discussions, they were really, really interesting, and I think I'll have to come back uh, next year as well. So this is, this is good. Um, I, I wanted to go just very briefly into what, what my involvement is with internet governance, and I approach that as, as an engineer. So my background is building technology, building products, trying to set up businesses around um, internet matters, and, and um, my approach to most of these topics that we'll be talking about today is, is kind of practical. The, how can we actually make this thing happen? Or we have, you know, at, you know, our companies or at the IETF or any other place, we have a need to deploy something. How can we, for instance, allocate the necessary numbers and, and names and, and uh, parameters that we need to set those up? And, and when we have some of those more complicated topics where we actually need to have a discussion in the world, you know, how do we deal with, you know, this type of uh, problematic situation in the internet. Um, we're also finding that that's, that's really, really um, um, key, or it's, it's, it's necessary to have those discussions. And um, I also want to take this opportunity to say that I'm not particularly fond of, um, like, the term internet governance. We'll be talking about much about that. Um, but, but it kind of implies that there's governing uh, where I think much of the internet is actually self-governed and self-running. It's a set of people and set of, set of companies, set of network administrators deciding to work together. That I decide to connect with you and you because I want to, and it's, it's beneficial for me. And it doesn't really need that much um, sort of you know, top-down um, management of, of any sort. Um, and most interesting questions actually have a technology component, have a policy component, um, could have a legal component or, or a business component or commercial component. So I, I think this this combination of these different issues that makes things interesting, and, and I think that's what most of our discussions are, are about. That we try to put these you know, different sets of people together and, and try to make sure that we make the right decisions, as opposed to having just the engineers decide everything. Um, although as an engineer, I kind of like that. As well, but um, or, or the the, the uh, lawmakers decide everything. So um, that's my approach and um, perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is my third time, I think, at uh, Internet Dagarna. Uh, when I came first, I was uh, working for the Swedish Internet Mafia at Skype, and uh, I moved recently because my, my company was bought by the famous uh, Finnish American company Microsoft Nokia. It was um, it was time to move on. As, but so it's my pleasure to be back uh, and talking not about net neutrality, but about internet governance. And, and uh, as Yari said, internet governance is a bit of a, uh, a vague term in a way. Um, but if we think about uh, how the internet is, uh, although the internet's basic architecture works, how it's coordinated, it's, there's no central authority out there that decides how the internet should be run. It's just not how it works. In fact, it's a bit more like the internet itself. It's very much a a distributed collaboration. You have a, a, an array of different organizations, different people, different mechanisms that together effectively make the internet work, whether it's the engineers in places like the Internet Engineering Task Force or the World Wide Web Consortium uh, or ISOC and, and, and various others and indeed governments on, in some areas. And then there's um, uh, one part of that ecosystem uh, is ICANN and ICANN is the place where um, 
the various stakeholders that are concerned with the domain name system of the internet gather and together design the procedures and, and policies that sustain the domain name system. So it's governments, it's industry, it's non-governmental organizations, even representatives of end users, they all gather and they work in a particular on uh, how you manage the um, sort of top level directory, if you will, uh, of the internet, the uh, IP addresses uh, and, uh, and the associated uh, protocol and parameters. And it's very much just, a, again, a coordination function between the various networks and people that, uh, that, that are involved in, in running the internet effectively. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> so the, this term, internet governance, that, that um, obviously is in the, the title here, but, but you, a few of you mentioned that it's kind of a difficult term to define, and, and um, I think the first time it came up was during this world, uh, or the process of the World Summit on the Information Society 2003. Uh, but surely the world was, uh, the, the internet was governed before that term was coined, or, or were, these, were, were the arrangements, all the arrangements on the internet, were they all loose and it worked sometimes or it didn't work or, or uh, before we had this term, does, does anyone want to speak to, to that? The world pre-internet, the internet governance term. I, I, I can start. Um, so um, at, at NTI, at the Department of Commerce, um, we were tasked in the, in the late 1990s um, to privatize and commercialize the management of the domain name system. So the US government, um, for historical reasons, and because of research funding with DARPA and ARPA and defense research and academic networks, had some residual authority and role with respect to the domain name system. DARPA and NS, the National Science Foundation, again, I told you I, I, there would be lots of acronyms on this panel, <laughs> um, you know, funded research and that led to sort of some of the packet switching and some of the technology and some of the pieces that make up today's internet. Um, so uh, the decision was made in the late 90s to commercialize this and to privatize it. And uh, what we did at, at NTIA was do a series of public comments. We issued a green paper and finally a white paper. And in that white paper, we specifically said, this is not about internet governance, by the way. Um, but no one seemed to have paid attention to that. But it really was, how do we actually involve more people into the process? And it's, I think it's um, from some of that exercise around that time, you know, ISOC was around, IETF was around, all of these organizations and structures come from that period. And it was about everybody, how they got together and how they coordinated. And I think they were looking for a way to describe coordination and not call it governments, but also sort of make sure that people realized that the system was working. But, I mean, that was my first, my first uh, encounter of the term, I think, was probably 98. I think, just briefly, I think uh, and Yari will know better than I, I think if you look even further back, um, you know, you had engineers working in this environment from the 70s and then in the early 80s and when they formed, uh, you know, they, they came together and, you know, put together standards. Uh, that's what engineers do, just try to make the network work. Uh, and then they created structures such as the Internet Architecture Board, uh, which sort of oversees the IETF. That was, I think, 1984. So it was very much an organic growth, started very much by the people that were, you know, just running the networks. And, and, and it happened, you know, with basically people coming at it from the, with the different perspectives, the different expertise, and, you know, making this thing work. So it's very much an organic collaborative process that grew into the sort of scenario we have today which is this distributed network of, of organizations broadly coordinating with each other to make the, the, the basic uh, architecture of the internet work. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Just briefly, if I may. So, uh, it's very interesting. Um, I think, personally, that governance, uh, what do we mean by governance? Governance is about structures, right? It's about orga organization of something that needs uh, that a, col a collaborative effort of people coming together to structure something. So up until 2003, the World Summit on Information uh, Society, there was still some, so, some form of governance. It was more loose, uh, loosely defined. It was not politically loaded as it is today, but as um, 
Jean-Jacques mentioned and as Fiona mentioned, there were deliberative processes as to how to organize this thing. When the United States government decided to privatize the domain name system and, create, and ICANN was created, that was uh, a form of how we are structuring this particular piece of the internet. Uh, I will take you as far back as when John Perley Barlow made the declaration, the very infamous declaration of independence for cyberspace, and he said, we don't need any governments. Again, that was an attempt of structuring and provide a structure for the internet. Now, 2003 and 2005 came, and suddenly more governments started talking about this. And Internet governance became this term which right now it's of course politically loaded and it has created all the complexities that we will try to uh, unravel today. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to say something? Yeah, so I mean the, most of you have already said um, that the, the key things, I mean it really is about organic growth and, and evolution both from the early days as, as well as into the formation of ICANN and parts of this, this ecosystem. Um, but it, it also continues to, to this day. I mean, there's been lots of um, changes in the last several years. Um, and the internet kind of seems to operate on the basis of, you know, what, what, is, what is it that we need? That, you know, initially we didn't need even the domain name system, and then we realized, oh, we actually need something practical to, for people to type in, and, um, um, and then one person could manage that, the whole thing. Eventually we need organizations for that, and as the importance of the internet has grown, we need, you know, even you know, more careful uh, organization of that and make sure that everyone's point of view is, is, is taken into account. And so it's kind of natural, you know, what, what do we need is, is kind of driving, driving this. And it, it, it's not part of, I mean, sometimes you'll read the history about this. It's not these big events only. There's, there's a lot of um, evolution in between. Thank you. Um, so, so I think um, that gives us a big, a pretty good picture of of what happened or, or how the internet was uh, worked and was coordinated and, and organized be, before the time internet governance sort of uh, came up. But so a few of you mentioned this uh, World Summit and the Information Society WISIS, uh, which is another acronym. Can, can Fiona, you were there at the very start of this. Can you explain what was the WISIS and, and uh, just a very brief sort of introduction uh, to set the scene on kind of the internet governance discussions that followed. Sure. So um, in the late 1990s, there were a variety of world summits. You might remember there was a summit on, on children and sustainable development and all, all these different uh, topics that were happening. And in 1998, there was a discussion about having a world summit on the information society with the idea that the conversation in 98, it seems so dated now, but the conversation was to talk about how to get technology and how to get people online and how to get everyone in the world access to technology. That was the premise of, of this particular summit. Um, and then in true UN fashion, they couldn't agree where to have the summit, so it became a summit in two phases. So we had a meeting in Geneva and a meeting in, in Tunis and Tunisia. Um, and associated with, with the summit itself in 2003, and then the second phase in 2005, there was a series of preparatory committee meetings um, because it takes governments a lot of time to talk and argue about words before we can agree to words. So for each, of the, each phase of the summit, there was uh, two to three prepcom meetings that were two weeks long. Uh, I think mostly all in Geneva. Yeah, he was remembering the, that particular suffering component. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was mostly in Geneva. And so, again, the idea originally was a summit to raise awareness about the importance of technology and getting people online and the idea of building this people-centered, inclusive information society. And it turned into, as it does in the UN system sometimes, a debate about uh, every political issue under the day. So um, it produced these great outcome documents that are online if you want to see them, the Geneva phase and the Tunis phase. But we had arguments about um, cybersecurity and we had arguments about... Um, copyright and we had arguments about creating a digital fund and we had arguments about who did or did not control the internet. So all the same conversations we have today. Um, but the end of it, I think we finally, you know, um, and it started with, and I think part of the challenge we see today's conversation was governments from around the world became more and more engaged. Okay, so you're thinking about the internet in the late 90s, we're moving into the 2000s, the internet became so pervasive, it became so important to so many people in so many different ways, government started to say, okay, what's my role? And what's my job? And how do I participate? And that's what the summit conversation turned into in many cases. And the role of government obviously is uh, very different and dependent upon historically what 
any government thinks its job is or its role is, and that's different based on culture, based on history, based on different parts of an, from an economy. So getting everyone to agree together was, was a challenging process. Um, but I think at the end of the five, the five years of what the WISIS process was, there were some great achievements. The documents, I think, probably still stand the test of time in terms of being meaningful. But there were two big outcomes, I think, from this process, which was when we first started the, the WISIS process, it was governments only in the room. No one else was allowed to be in the room unless they run a government delegation. The United States always has other stakeholders on its delegate delegations. Sweden always does that as well. Not every country works that way. Um, at the end of the five-year process, though, there was this idea that other stakeholders should be part of the process and in the room and actually able to participate in conversations. So over a five-year process, we went from people being forcibly removed from rooms that weren't part of government delegations to people being welcomed in to actually give views and participate in the process. So I think that was a great outcome of this process. And again, th this endorsement and this idea that the internet should be governed, if for, for lack of a better word, or coordinated with all stakeholders being involved. And that idea and that sentiment was finally agreed after five years of discussion. So, so this is where this term multi-stakeholder comes up. And it's become one of these terms that I think everyone uses for all sorts of contexts, where, whether or not it's multi-stakeholder. Um, <clears throat> But I think it's, it's, it's interesting to get the background because um, for, for some of us, um, multi-stakeholder is maybe natural that in, in order to make, to, to discuss internet issues, you need the technical people there. For some things, you, you, you need civil society there. For some things, you need governments there. You need the, the private sector. Um, so I think when you discuss internet governance now, it's the multi-stakeholder model is, is seen as, as quite a, um, a normal model, but it, it's also a very painful model, isn't it? Isn't it easier it's if just one stakeholder makes a decision about something? Well, you could, you could think it's easier simply because <laughs> you just have a smaller number of people to deal with and, or, or positions, but actually I, f I find it f far easier to have in the room people that actually know what they're talking about. Uh, so when I was in government and I, I was faced with a new policy issue, well, I wanted to get informed and I had to do quite a bit of work to reach out to the various stakeholders and try to understand, you know, certainly in my country at the time, what were the different perspectives and then try to come to a balanced position that would represent you know, the good of the country, if you will. But that's not a very effective way of doing things. If, on the contrary, you're around the table and you have those people here, you know, whether it's, it's the engineer, whether it's the lawyer, whether it's the civil society advocate, uh, if we're all around the room, actually, it's far easier because we have those perspectives together. Mm -hmm. And if together we can initiate policy and we can come to agree a policy by consensus, which is how our organizations work, our respective organizations work, then we end up with far better policies. Uh, so I find it far easier, in fact, because I know that the, the outcome should work for most people rather than, rather than having an outcome which, as often in traditional systems, will benefit often just one side of the, 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 the story, or one side of the argument. So I think it's a, it's a much more sustainable and much more forum model to have really, I mean, it's about getting better outcomes, better expertise around the table, people that actually really do know what they're talking about. And then you come to, a, to an agreement together. So it's, it presents sort of day-to-day -day challenges because you have to try and and come to a consensus. So you have to make compromises in your positions, etc. But actually, at the end of the day, when you produce a policy, it's a policy that's broadly accepted by everyone, rather than a policy that's foisted, forced upon other groups that, that only certain groups might, might like, because they just happen to be closer to the controlling, centralized authority. I think it's a much, much easier model in my mind. And, and on top of that, Yes, so and on top of that, we have got to understand that the internet is not like any other medium, right? I mean, I am a lawyer, I love working on the internet, but I don't even pretend that I understand fully the technology. And this is why we need the techies to come in and explain the technology. And then you have the, the, the highly commercial aspect of the internet. I mean, we hear that economies now depend on the internet. You need to bring those businesses in order to be able and explain to you why they're so dependent on the internet. And then, of course, you know, uh, the internet also has created communities of people. It has created those bloggers who um, are in, in challenging 
countries and they need to be protected by the civil society groups that are outside and it has, uh, it has created this notion of us being able to understand what is happening in uh, other countries and the challenges that people face and how we need to support them in order to be able and learn uh, what, they, uh, what they're doing. And of course then you have governments that they need to support. The governments will create the policies and the laws that will support the infrastructure of the internet, that will support businesses on the internet. So there is this multiplicity of voices that the internet really invites. And I think that by now it is clear to everyone that this cannot, the internet cannot be we cannot be discussing, I, won't use, I will try to avoid as much as I can to use the word govern, but it cannot, we cannot discuss issues on the internet just with one set of stakeholders. I think that in 2014, by now we have come some sort of a closure of the fact that we are all vested in making this work. Of course, we are coming from, um, stakeholders come from different backgrounds, but as Zanjak said, uh, this is, if you want, the challenge, but at the same time, the beauty of what is happening. And yes, it is difficult, but Fiona, having worked for the government for so long, I don't think that she will say just that if you only have governments in the room, it's any much easier. So what Fiona mentioned that came out of those two summits, the idea that everybody should be able and express their opinion on how the internet is to be managed, uh, I think this has been one of the greatest wins uh, of that summit uh, back then. Right. So, so one of the things that came, or yeah, one of the main things that came, came out of uh, uh, the Wizards uh, was the Internet Governance Forum, the IGF, uh, which uh, takes place every year and, and where all these different stakeholders come together and, and uh, discuss things. Um, um, just to get to, to sort of the, the core of this, the discussion, I'm just going to go through a few things that have happened between uh, the formation of the IGF and to where we are today. And maybe some of you can comment and, and uh, explain a little bit um, um, what these things were. So the IGF was this, um, was, is this sort of unique platform where all these different stakeholders can come together. They've got workshops to discuss specific issues, but also these main sessions where uh, some of the really uh, big topics are discussed. <clears throat> some have criticised the, the IGF for not being a decision-making body, just being a talk shop, while others actually say that that's the strength of the IGF, that, that everyone can go to the IGF and very openly uh, exchange information and ideas and then go back to, to their communities or to their countries and, and make the decisions they need to. Uh, I think you touched a little bit, little bit upon that, that the, the very difficult process of uh, governments all in a room negotiating text. Um, uh, and then, a few things happened in the last few years. Uh, there was the World Conference on International Telecommunications in December 2012, and I'll read out a few headlines uh, about that. Uh, ITU and Google face off at Dubai conference over the future of the internet. <clears throat> Chaos will reign if telco, call, telco talks fail. ITU to EU, we don't want to control the internet, honest. Um, UN's bid for internet domination. Wicked treaty talks end in Dubai while walk out of US allies and US sides with UK walks away from sticky wicked tre treaty. Um, so I'll go a few, through a few of the events and maybe you can comment on it. So a question there I have is what was this wicked thing and why does everyone sigh deeply when you mention it? And what state did it actually leave the internet governance discussions? Because uh, from the outside, it, it seemed like all these great multi-stakeholder discussions just completely broke down. Uh, then something happened in, in 2013, and that was um, the Snowden revelations. Um, and there were a few different reactions to this around the world, and then you also heard things like, Brazil is building its own US independent internet. Um, and uh, some of the technical organizations uh, s responded with um, actually pointing out some of the security work being done and actually also upping its security efforts, so to speak. Um, 
And then in the midst of this kind of US domination discussion, all of a sudden the NTIA announced its intent to transition key internet domain name functions, uh, which caused the headlines, Obama seizes control of the internet, or Republicans fear Obama will let Russia seize internet power, and US announces intention to hand over control over DNS. Uh, all sounds a little bit ominous, if you ask me. Um, that same year, just a month later, there was this big conference in Brazil called the Net Mundial. Uh, the future of the internet debated at Net Mundial Brazil. And, and uh, every time you mention Net Mundial, everyone looks very um, relaxed and happy. And, and uh, there's this kind of uh, positive atmosphere that enters the room. Uh, and then just recently, a few of us went to the ITU Plenipotentiary Conference um, where all the, the world's governments came together to discuss um, the ITU mandate and within that were a few uh, discussions about internet. And after all this controversy, uh, I read uh, headlines like, UN takeover of internet postponed indefinitely or stop the presses, ITU is not resolving to take over the internet. And the, the US government described it as the Busan consensus. So does this mean that we've dealt with the difficult issues, there was a breakdown, but now we're solving these difficult issues and now we have consensus? Is this where we are? Can we end the discussion here? Yeah, I, I think we can end the discussion. I mean, we're okay. all friends now, and you know, they're all issues solved, and you know, obviously there's no problems in the internet anymore, right? <laughs> so, um, I, I think we've seen a shift, like from the wicked times to to uh, 2014, and um, there's a broader understanding of how you know multi-stakeholder this this topic actually is, and how much you actually need the different parties on the table, um, and um, broad recognition that that's actually the right right way of going forward. It doesn't mean that everything's solved. There will be, I mean, the internet is important. Of course, everyone wants to, you know, even in the future, take over, you know, various parts of the internet because that, that would be um, um, nice um, in, in their view, at least. Um, and and there, there still will be, you know, huge problems in the internet we're, that we're trying to deal with. But, but I think I'm, I'm on a far more positive mind this year than, than in past years, so. Okay. And so let's let's try to put everything because you have mentioned. So you know, this has been a big journey. What you have mentioned. Let's try to put a little bit everything into context. So after the word summit, the 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 IGF, the Internet Governance Forum, is created, and the first IGF took place in Athens in 2006. And back then, nobody really knew what was happening. Actually, for the the few I think that I see people who attended it, if you remember, it was all about ICANN and domain names. That was just because ICANN and, the do and domain names was at, at their peak and uh, we had a lot of uh, trademark issues, intellectual property issues. And suddenly we are in Net Mundial. I think that this is a process of how the internet is evolving organically and around it you have the various issues that follow the internet and they follow this organic evolution. But all about that is the role of how can we best address in this multi-stakeholder system the challenges that are being f that we're facing, that the internet is facing, whether we're talking about domain names or about spam or about copyright? Is it a way within this inclusive structure that sees so many different stakeholders coming together to discuss things, to address those things? And Depending, you know, Wicked, for example, I think demonstrated clearly that there is another stakeholder uh, group called, you know, that belongs into the private sector, but they, they are called the telecom operators, that they have their own vision of how the internet is. At the same time, uh, we, s we see in all this evolution an increasing interest from the governments. I mean, in 2006, there were not so many governments in Athens, if I remember. But right now, there is this increasing interest of governments. And of course, identifying their precise role, especially uh, when Traditionally, they have been vested with the authority of making decisions, and suddenly the internet space, they come and they have to work with all these stakeholders. It's, of course, a big challenge, but 
this is where we are. We are still continuing the discussions. And for a lot of people, things are not moving fast enough. I think that there has been a huge amount of process from where we were in 2006 and where we currently are. I think Busan, for example, demonstrated clearly that, that there is room for governments even to sit down and agree and accept that this is uh, what's happening at the internet. The Net Mundial did exactly that. It also demonstrated. So in Brazil, uh, uh, there was this Net Mundial, and we called it Net Mundial because it coincided with the Mundial, the actual Mundial. And literally, everything was put together so quick, and it's such an organic way, and it did work. It created energy, it created enthusiasm that we can actually do this. And Net Mundial came out with a set of principles that they're not new, they didn't reinvent the wheel, but they reaffirmed and reconfirmed essentially what all everybody and people long before me have been talking about and have been trying uh, for including what Fiona mentioned in the beginning. So I, I, I come from a place I'm as positive as Yari is, that we are moving and we are moving towards the right direction. So I think, I mean, we've used the word multi-stakeholder a lot up here, and I think it's important to keep in mind that multi-stakeholder isn't in itself the goal of what we're talking about. The broader goal is economic development, free expression, social development, all these things, and the internet is this trans or has been this transformative tool that lets people do all these things. And our view has always been and remains that the best way to let that um, continue and to develop and further enhance and further go and spread around the world is to actually inv involve everyone. And so the idea, what, and this is important contextually, because the idea with internet governance that we're talking about is making sure that the internet works and is coordinated, governed, pick your verb, but similar to the way the internet was developed, which was permissionless by a group of engineers, by people working together in a collaborative way. And you know, this happened without the express permission of governments, any particular government or group of governments. And so what we're seeing and what we've been seeing over the last you know, 15 years is a tension in that, which is a, t a technology that was developed and has become quite powerful without governments saying it's okay, without governments being involved in any meaningful way at the outset. And so what we saw at all these different meetings and these headlines, which are always a little bit misleading, is this tension between sort of a traditional government Westphalian state system government model versus a collaborative, decentralized, organized system. And at all these international meetings for the last 10 or 12 years, what you've seen is a clash of these systems. So the WICKET, which was this, this, this treaty conference of the ITU, um, the ITU is an intergovernmental organization. It predates the UN. It, um, Probably it's having its 150th anniversary uh, next year, so it predates the UN by about 80 or 90 years. Um, used to be the Telegraph Union, morphed into the Telecommunications Union at a time when governments um, and government monopolies or government companies, you know, develop a telephone system and need, needed to interconnect, and so governments were the ones that negotiated those things. And the Wicket w was um, an update of a treaty from 1988, and that treaty in 1988 actually led to the liberalization. Um, and competition in the telecom space and privatization in many parts of the world. And so that treaty hadn't been updated since 1988. So there was a debate and a discussion about should we update the treaty? And what you had in Dubai was sort of, um, you know, some agreements on some key tele telecom issues and fundamental sort of infrastructure telecom issues, but a huge disagreement have gone, should you apply these uh, rules to the internet? And so the United States view was no, and the view of most, most countries in, in Europe was no, and um, 55 countries did not sign this treaty, but 85 did, mm -hmm. right? So you were left with this, this, this feeling that the world was sort of split a little bit. So again, it, all of the things that Narani is mentioning and all these events, it's this tension between letting the internet flourish and be coordinated or governed or managed, again, pick the verb that you want, um, in a way that involves everybody or do governments as governments have a say. It's also important to keep in mind that in the multi-stakeholder model, governments are a part of that system. No one's excluded. And governments um, increasingly more and more are me more meaningfully engaged in, in the ICANN system through the Governmental Advisory Committee, through the IETF, and through things that ISOC is doing. But that's what this has all been about for many years. And so the question is, are, are we, um, is everything okay now? I, I'm not quite sure. Are we on a better path than we were at Wicked? Absolutely. 
Um, but part of that is because people feel invested in the system. There's been a lot of changes in the different internet institutions. It's more opening, I think, to people. It's more welcoming. There's language translation. There's transcription. All these things are making it easier. Um, the introduction of internationalized domain names is making it easier for people to be a part of the internet in their own culture and their own language. And as that's happening, people are more engaged and more involved and feel more commitment to the approach. And, and that Mundial was an interesting um, meeting to be at for those of us that were privileged enough to be there because it's the first time I've ever seen literally, um, I don't know, a couple thousand people in a room and there were four lines and um, for, to get to, to four microphone lines. And the line you were in depended upon which stakeholder group you were in. The government line was always the longest line in terms of people wanting to talk. So it was really interesting that people get called on one by one by one in a much more equitable session than you would ever get in any other kind of UN system or anywhere else. And that was most interesting from my perspective for Net Mundial. But again, this, this, this debate and this discussion will probably continue. I think there's some governments that are uneasy with the system the way that it is. There are some governments that are unclear how to use the system the way that it is. Um, and that's what a lot of the initiatives are about now. And then there's, you know, getting other stakeholders from other parts of other countries involved. And so I don't know that it's, it's smooth sailing from here, but I definitely think have gotten better. But I also think now that the challenge of the internet and the, the, the policy issues of the internet are becoming more and more challenging and complicated too. It's a good point about um, that we, we talk about internet governance and multi-stakeholderism. Uh, but that's not the end goal. It's a vehicle, right? It's a way of reaching, uh, reaching something else. Um, and, and I actually thought maybe we can get a little bit more concrete and look at some of these issues. Where are the actual tensions? So, so for example, the, the ISOC talks, often talks about protecting the, the openness of the internet and, and um, ensuring equitable access, etc. cetera. Um, how does internet governance fit into that? So, uh, part of the discussion is how we will be able, you know, how, uh, how people around the world will be able to use the internet. And we need, to, when we, it is very interesting, when we talk about internet governance, we only think about those people who actually use the internet. We have to bear in mind that there are <laughs> quite a couple of billion still that they're not online and they're not reaping any of the benefits that all of us in this room uh, do so. Uh, one of the things that the Internet Society is very clear about is that the, the, the openness of the Internet is key to its evolution, uh, but it's also key to the benefit that it brings to uh, societies and people around the world. And that is why uh, one of the things that we're very strongly uh, uh, about is the idea of this permissionless innovation, the idea that you don't really have to go and ask for permission to create anything on the internet, the, the, the standards of the internet are open and you give, and, and they provide the possibility to any kid who has the, the inspiration or the creativity to, and sits in their own garage somewhere in the world to actually create the next big thing, the Facebook, the Google, the Twitter, or whatever else you want to call it. So uh, when, when we see as, as the Internet Society that there are attempts at any level from any stakeholder to jeopardize this um, this culture, because it is a culture that has been built and sustained over the years by the community of engineers, uh, then we are, make, we are stepping in to make sure that we provide the bigger picture. And we, and we say, with the help of governments that aspire to the same ideals and the other organizations and the other stakeholders that understand that if we change the nature of the internet, a lot of what, of what we are seeing right now might not have happened. Mm. A lot of the, the benefits that the internet has brought to the world might not have happened. The, the, the communication that has taken place, the, the way the people have connected, the way the information has exchanged will not have happened. So essentially, part of the discussions on internet governance is to retain this openness of the network and the idea that anyone it will, uh, should be able to contribute to its organic evolution. Okay, thank you. I'm going to throw a few more questions, then I'm uh, going to get a few questions from the audience. So get prepared. I think uh, we'll get two or three or four questions from the audience that we'll throw at the panel uh, all at once. Jean-Jacques. 
I mean, you, I think you, you asked us to mention examples, concrete examples of things, there's many. Um, one that uh, I find quite a good example of, of uh, how we coordinate things is in the matter of addressing. You know, basically we've, uh, we've been relying in the, in the last couple of decades on a, on a type of addresses for behind each website, for instance, or each device connected to the internet, a series of numbers that corresponded to a, a version of addressing on the internet called IPv4. And basically it had only is it eight numbers um, separated by dots? And then basically, you know, we were in a situation when this type of addressing existed that we had only a few tens of millions of machines connected to the internet. And then all of a sudden, the internet explodes and we're looking at billions of users and billions of devices connected to the internet. And basically, there's just not enough addresses. So the internet community comes together and designs a new type of addressing that's now called IPv6. Um, and you know, it goes through the standards bodies, gets agreed, and then organizations such as ICANN handle the uh, pool of addresses, others like ISOP help raise awareness about IPv6, and slowly we get um, this, this new addressing system implemented uh, globally so that we, indeed we can let the internet continue to scale, continue to grow to however many billion machines and people might be connected to it. That's one of the very concrete things that this model has enabled. Okay, thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about, or, or, or I mentioned this, that you know maybe there was internet governance before the, the term was coined. Uh, and um, I went back to, so, so the, uh, well, there are a few founders of the internet, but Bob Kahn and, and Vince Cerf, who wrote the, the communication protocol that the internet uses uh, still today, TCPIP. Um, I found it, uh, he, Bob Kahn wrote down four ground rules for this. Um, and I'm going to throw this at, at you, Yari. Uh, so I'll read them out. Each distinct network would have to stand on its own. No internal changes could be required to any such network to connect to the internet. Communication would be on a best effort basis. If a packet didn't make it to the final destination, it would shortly be retransmitted from the source. Black boxes would be used to connect to these networks. They would later be called gateways or routers. There would be no information retained by the gateways about the individual flows of packets passing through, the, f passing through them, thereby keeping them simple and avoiding complicated adaptation and recovery from various failure nodes. There would be no global control at the operation level. I would argue that there are actually some internet governance principles in those design principles. What do you think about that? Um, of course, and I mean, it, it really goes to the, the evolution or the permissionless innovation and end-to-end -end principle that we can actually create these applications as fast as, as we want to um, at, at the end point without having to ask, you know, the, the router vendor or the, the, the operator or the government or, you know, or your mom for permission. And, and that, that's really key. And, and of course, as the internet has evolved, um, you know, we also str struggle with some issues. We have middle boxes, we have NATs, we have, you know, all kinds of things um, in the network today that erode some of these freedoms that, that we had. And, and that, that's a struggle. And we're IPv6 is one way of getting away from some of those issues, but um, but but it, 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 the, the the principle still st stands and is very important. So, so when you talk about what's actually at stake these uh, in these discussions, um, if we're going to get really really concrete, because we often try to be quite polite when we sit up on stage and and we don't we want to talk about the the principles that we you know, hold that no one can really argue against openness and inclusiveness, etc. But are there actual, have you actually seen actual proposals that uh, would break some of, of, would basically break the internet or would make it not as good as it is today? Um, I, I'm not sure I want to go through the, you know, any particular specific proposals, but there's been tons of proposals, for instance, um, dealing with addressing and and the way that the internet works is that you know, people, you know, individual network owners decide how to do, how they structure their networks, and and those networks often cross borders, and, and you have like multinational companies, you have organizations that that cross borders, 
Um, and you know that that's it's their business. They do it the best it fits them. And and some of those proposals that we've seen might change that so that now it's more national. Like you actually have to take into account um, you know something that's not natural for your per for your network in this particular organization just because someone believes that there's a border in, in between. Um, so, so yes, I mean, there, there are, are some proposals that would um, take away some of the freedoms. Uh, I'd say that that's definitely one of the tension points, too, that you can't really, uh, that governments often think in terms of national borders, while um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, the Internet doesn't follow those borders, right? So let's, let's uh, get a few questions from the floor. Uh, We've got um, one over there, and I'm thinking let's get a few questions and then we can all try to uh, address them at once. Yeah, if it's on no. there, I think. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Maria Dolores Erling. And uh, I wanted to ask you if um, so. We, you know, we have the as as humans, we have the opportunity to have technology driving us, or we can also take a lead. Um, in two hundred thousand years ago, we had the technology of stone, and then it became the Bronze Age, and then the Iron Age, and then uh, at the sixteen hundred, we had uh, uh, printing, right? So, uh, and, and during all these changes, uh, we as humans also evolved from small societies to groups to larger communities. And from the printing system, uh, we became more nation-centric oriented. And this is where we're standing from, uh, the, the roots of uh, and the foundations of politics and law and... and uh, press is, is nation-centric today, uh, and press more obviously, and, and with the internet uh, going through more of a global change. Uh, but I really want to ask you, uh, if, if this is the change we're heading for, uh, how do you think the, the law or, uh, and the politics would change within the next three generations? Like, not this generations, but I'm looking like three generations ahead. Um, and going from more nation-centric thinking to more global-centric thinking. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions? Sorry? All right, well, then we'll get to that one. Thank you. It's, it's interesting. Um, First, uh, I often get on panels where they say, what's the horizon for 2020? I think it's the first time I have someone asking me, what's the horizon for the 22nd century? Um, <laughs> so it's very much crystal ball gazing. Um, I think it's, it's interesting you raised the printing press. Uh, the, the internet's often been uh, nicknamed the printing press on steroids. Um, and it's interesting because well, if you, if I was going to say, if you remember, I, I guess we don't remember, but the, the when the printing press arrived, it was a major revolution because the production of books was very small, of course, at the time, and to an extent served directly or indirectly as a, as a control uh, tool. So when the printing press arrived, it was a, uh, a massive uh, threat to existing systems and mechanisms. So then that it morphed and it was used in other ways. Well, you know, the internet could be used in all sorts of weird and wonderful and maybe bad ways. And I think we have to be watchful for that. Um, it's interesting how the internet has been very user-driven in its development, uh, certainly up to the 90s. Now we've got the sort of the traditional uh, powers looking more closely at it. And I think we have to be watchful that we don't lose the, the, the dynamism and the, the, the sort of tool for, for, for freedom and human progress that the internet has become because we try to sort of chain it to old models. That's going to be a challenge, uh, not, not, not for the two or three generations, certainly for the next one. I couldn't talk uh, for, for the next two or three. Um, so I think we have to be mindful of that. And, and I actually don't think that you automatically have to have a clash between the 
old nation-state system based on borders and this novel system of multi-stakeholder, uh, you know, cross-border dealing of issues. On the contrary, I think, you know, the, co the two could coexist well. I think the nation-state system has, you know, has, uh, is, has been challenged quite a bit. Uh, and, and, and you see that through all sorts of trans-border movement that would happen probably even if the internet didn't exist. And that the nation-state system is, is ill-equipped to deal with that. And so to have another model that, that comes along and provides avenues where you can deal with cross-border challenges, but you can deal with them in novel fashion where you involve all the right people and you can, you know, come to some sort of consensus agreement with all the parties, not just one part of the, the people involved, I think is, it's quite remarkable. And what I'm hoping, if we, if we think back about the previous question on, you know, how things have developed over the past 50, 15 years, I'm hoping it's a process of evolution, of maturation, where people get to understand how this new model of working, uh, you know, works in practice, and they come to like it, and they come to evolve with it. So, you know, if we, if we ended up with a model of international governance, generally, not, not just for the internet, which was much more based on consensus amongst the relevant parties, whoever they may be, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be in a, in a much better situation on a whole array of issues. So that's my optimistic side. Uh, the, 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 the worrisome side of, or the yeah, worrier side of me says, you know, there's a lot of challenges ahead and a lot of uh, vested interest in the old models. Uh, so we're going to have to guard against that. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of work to do. And we, we all have, a, I think that's the other thing we need to remember. We all have a stake in this and we all have a voice. So do raise your voice. Yeah, so I just wanted to add one, one thing, and that, that is that e even if sort of the importance of place kind of disappears over time because we have technology to connect uh, anyone to, to anywhere, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is still discussing with, with everyone. We, you know, you all are probably aware of this concept of like you have certain kinds of political views and then you all only follow that kind of world or that kind of discussion or that kind of news media or that kind of friends on social media. So, I mean, th there is this possibility of, you know, the creating new kinds of, um, you know, groups of um, people discussing. And, and I mean, this is kind of like meta level or, or um, glo global level discussion, but um, taking it back to our um, practical problems with, with internet governance, we see that uh, in, in practical terms, because we, we talked about multi-stakeholder, how important, how good it is to involve everyone. But it actually takes a lot of effort. Like we, I mean, for us at the IETF, ISOC does a lot of work to draw in you know, um, um, individual technologists around the world from developing nations, for instance. And um, we have also get a lot of um, government regulator policy type of people nowadays in, in our organization discussing. But it's a lot of work. Um, and, and reaching those people is difficult, finding them is difficult. And from the point of view of those people, that, you know, them realizing that, oh, there's this other thing that I have to care about, that, you know, these guys are developing, say, um, emergency call technology and I have to go there and discuss. Um, it, it's painful also from their, their side that they have to put in effort to do that. So that, that's the, the pr practical and difficult thing that we actually have to do here. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, a couple of things. So uh, uh, one of the great things about the Internet is that we really do not know what's going to happen. We, I mean, the, uh, the Internet is impossible to the extent that we really do not know how it's going to evolve, and this is what's great about it. But um, one of the uh, first and foremost, uh, and uh, right now I think I'm sp well, I think I am speaking as a user, the Internet is about choice. I can, you know, it, people choose how to use the internet. They choose whether they want to connect with their local communities or they want to be part of, the, of, of a global community, of a more global community. So I don't think I'm able to predict how the, th the next three uh, generations will react to that. But what we see happening is that the more generations come in, the easier it is for them to relate to the internet. Um, now, as a lawyer, I can tell you that the, issue, the legal issues around the internet, especially the, the, the jurisdictional issue on the internet, has been with us since the commercialization of the internet in the 90s and will continue to be with us for many, many years to come simply because we, uh, the international community has yet to come up with an efficient system that departs from the traditional norm, international norm setting and follows the pace 
and uh, the nature of the internet, because again, the, the internet is this whole new thing that demands also, if you want, new norms to come in and new ways of, of thinking. So I think that to, to, to the extent that uh, we, uh, the internet will evolve, one of the, the features that will remain consistent is this ability to provide choice. Uh, to people, so I see the next three generations actually getting involved on the internet and shaping the internet the way they feel it should be shaped and uh, be able to participate in it the way they want. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, was the, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I have a question. Uh, it's uh, a less visionary question. Uh, it's more about challenges. Uh, why? Uh, who, not who, but what are the arguments for advocating uh, uh, defining uh, perimeters in the same way as we define country borders? Is there any argument put forward or is it just a simpler way of perceiving the world? Or are, are you looking for arguments? rational arguments? Or? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rational <laughs> arguments. <laughs> And I have nothing to say. <laughs> so we um, we just we, we were just in um, Busan at the, another ITU meeting. This was the ITU plenipotentiary, which is really an administrative conference of ITU. They elect officials, uh, budgetary, you know, things like that, um, and sort of sort of lay out general work plans. And there was a couple of proposals that were put forward that were challenging from at least the perspective of the United States. But the the countries that put them forward, in this case, I'm thinking India in particular, the person that was behind the proposal really was trying to, in his heart of hearts, solve a problem he has locally, which has to deal with security and things like that. But his solution would have been to actually impose um, for just for simplicity's sake, a telephone numbering, a telephone system on top of the internet. Uh, the proposal that he put on the table that was debated was to develop a system uh, so that governments could trace, track, and monitor uh, conversations happening in their country. Now, his intent was, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, was about security and preserving peace and stability in his country. The proposal that he put forward would have required a complete redesign of the internet so which we opposed, and then Sweden and others opposed as well, Narani was there. Um, but again, so that was you know giving a particular individual in a particular country benefit of the doubt. That That is kind of what they were trying to put forward. For some countries, it's it's different. It's um, it's it's a perspective, it's what's the role of government, it's I'm uncomfortable with this multi-stakeholder collaborative system you're describing, I'm much more comfortable in an authoritarian regime in a world that I know. So I think the world can probably be divided into three or four different types of countries. Um, those that I would say have the perspective that the US and Sweden and others in Europe have. Um, those that are more authoritarian in nature and it's a cultural and a philosophy and what their worldview is. And then I think there's a middle group of countries that are searching for meaningful ways to solve problems. And they're looking and they're grasping at whatever best ways to solve those problems. And in the case of India at Plenty Pot, this was the way that they thought was best to solve the problem. Uh, I mean, another example is, uh, which, which you touched upon was, was the idea of, so currently you have these regional internet registries in, in each of the five regions who distribute IP addresses and they're distributed according to need to, to internet service providers. But, but this is another idea that's popped up, uh, pops up once in a while about maybe a UN body like the ITU could have their own registry and... Um, distribute to those who need them. And um, I would say that, that um, in some cases they're actually trying to solve uh, what they perceive as a, a problem about part of the developing world not being connected to the internet. Uh, so maybe by having the ITU distribute IP addresses to them they can get on board quicker. What's your reaction to that? So, uh, very briefly, uh, we have got to understand that for a lot of countries, the IDU is their only venue. Mm -hmm. And because they can relate, and at the end of the day, they relate to the extent that I have a vote. I, I can raise my flag and I have uh, a vote. And I think this is what we, all of us in, in, in that we believe and we support the multi-stakeholder system are trying to do, to tell them that there are other venues as well. Uh, where they can address their problems, and some of them are legitimate concerns. So, for example, uh, in a lot of uh, developing countries, there is not enough infrastructure. So, 
uh, the accessing the internet, even though it's difficult, it's also extremely expensive. So, you know, the Internet Society, for example, is very uh, vested in setting up IXPs, and those are internet exchange points, I'm sure that the audience knows it better than me, where they allow traffic to run locally, and then it doesn't cost as much. So it is very important for, for these countries to be able and understand that they have a voice. Within the ICANN structure is the Governmental Advisory Committee, which, of course, the numbers are increasing, and this is positive because they see it as another venue where they can go and they can speak about the issues. So it takes time, and for a lot of these countries, a lot of the things that are happening around the world, the Net Mundial, for example, I, I have been told, and uh, you know, it was an eye-opener, it's not even budgeted. So suddenly calling for something and expecting, you know, so many countries to go that they're already struggling to participate in other international fora is a big challenge. So I think that part of the work that we are doing and we, we should continue to do is to demonstrate that there are other venues where th a lot of these issues can be addressed and uh, potentially be resolved. Hmm. Uh, I'm going um, <clears> to... <throat> So, so you touched upon um, the fact that WISIS originally was a, supposed to be a development conference, uh, and then it sort of morphed into this uh, sort of process about who controls what. Um, but if we go back to, to the development side, and, and I would say that there's a genuine concern uh, amongst some countries in the developing world that it is not happening fast enough for them. Um, and um, so, for example, a few of the things that came up at the plenipotentiary, for example, was, was the, the issue of transit costs, for example, interconnectivity, and, and the fact that um, both in, in, in some countries that are not so interconnected, uh, you pay a lot more simply to send traffic, but then you also pay a lot more to send traffic to the outside world, um, and that was, and, and the ideas there were were that um, the RTU would go in and, and help with those things. Um, so, I mean, some of the tensions are about what you talked about the the you know a cultural tension almost about how comfortable you are with different governance forms, but some of the tensions are about the actual solutions you think will solve your problem. So, for example, the development um, issue that keeps coming up. I'd like your reaction to that. Is it a real concern, or can we say that, no, if you just sit back, your needs will be addressed through the existing organizations we have? Um, or um, is the concern real, but you believe in different solutions? Just a few thoughts on that. So, I don't think you can sit back. I mean, there is, um, certainly in the World Summit on the Information Society, there was a real worry over digital divide. I don't think that's gone. We have many more people connected to the internet, close to three billion. It's amazing. I mean, it's the technology that has reached the most users in the shortest space of time. I mean, we're talking, I think, the, 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 figure, yeah. the figures are that the internet reached in, in four years, as many users as television took 13 years, and the radio 50 years. You know, that's the kind of scale we're talking about, so it's doing well. But at the same time, there's always more that can be done. Uh, we've got another 4 billion people, 4 billion plus people that, that uh, are not connected to the internet, or not able to connect to the internet, so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, part of that is, is, uh, is you know, within, within governments, national governments, uh, and, and local industries uh, remit. Um, Part of that, you know, the ITU can help with, and part of that is also projects that, for instance, such as internet exchange points that, you know, we can help with in terms of capacity building, in terms of awareness raising, um, and and so there's a, there's a lot of work that can be done, but it's it's uh, it's kind of cumulative work. I think it's 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 the work that all of us, all of the various organisations, uh, combined, if you will, can do, um, and a, and a useful vehicle to sort of raise aware, the initial awareness of some of those governments, especially in, the world, in sort of developing countries, is, is the Internet Governance Forum that we touched on very briefly earlier. Um, at the time when it was created during the World Summit on Information Society, a lot of the developing countries, of course, were worried about digital divide, but they were from, from a sort of op uh, operational perspective, if you will, they said, look, you know, you guys in the West, we have all, you have all these 
organizations, these places where you can exchange ideas, where you can learn, like OECD, like the EU, etc. We in the fellow, we don't really have anyone. We have the ITU, but they don't really know, they, they deal with the infrastructure, they don't really deal with this internet stuff. We need something else. And that's why the Internet Governance Forum was created, because it's, it's a global place where people can come in and, and discuss issues, share ideas, think about solutions. And a lot of it is not because there's no solutions to a particular problem, it's just that they haven't heard about those solutions, because there's no place that they were aware of where they could find the solutions. Now we have uh, at least a vehicle and several vehicles to do that. We have our own efforts to try and raise awareness of our processes, how you can take part, for instance, in ICANN or in ITF, etc. And we just need to do more of that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of solutions out there. It's a question of, of, of pushing the solutions out. And when I look at the amazing progress that has been made in, in some of the continents like Africa, for instance, in terms of connectivity, you know, where they have now cables running a, on, on, on either side of the continent that are providing you know, high bandwidth connectivity. I mean, it's, it was a pipe dream. Uh, it's a bad expression, maybe. It was a dream <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, and now it's there, and it's taking a bit of time for some countries. Others are, are, have got great connections, so it's, it's promising, but we, we constantly have to, to move ahead. Again, I think it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort that has to happen because each of us have got a useful part of the puzzle and then we've got mechanisms such as IGF where we can all gel and, and sort of share experiences. So yeah, I think it's again a collaborative effort to, to help solve these issues. I don't think that you know, if we set up a, you know, a body for development of the internet, it would solve anything. I, I really don't think that's the way forward. It's more about combining our, our forces, cooperating with one another, and with, with people in country that we're, we're going to really make a difference, like we have in the past 10 years. We just need to continue to do, do that and better. Thank we have a question nice. up here. Nirani, I have a question. Yeah, okay, can, we, can I just let Yari respond to this as well and then we'll, yeah. we'll go to the audience. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch on this, this question of three billion uh, users and getting the, the, the four next billions there as well. And I, I think I'm actually very, very positive on that. Um, and we should not, I mean, that, that gets mentioned a lot. And we, we, we need a lot of attention on that, but I'm, I'm, I'm still very optimistic that it's actually going to happen, and very soon in the next couple of years. Uh, in my day job at Ericsson, I have some colleagues who are tracking uh, mobile broadband, for instance, and stands today at about 2.5 billion uh, users <laughs> out of 5 billion um, mobile phone users but they're predicting 7 billion um, in 2019. Wow. And, and so, so a big part of the planet will be connected to the internet in a moment. And I, again, I don't want to take away anything from how difficult that is, that we have a lot of challenges. We're going to have to address them. Um, but it's not just that. I think it's the openness and the competitive policies and you know, all, all kinds of other things that, that really matter and then making sure that we actually have the local communities benefiting from uh, from this internet thing. Um, and, and going back to the original discussion, I, I think it's not so much about the organization, whether it's ITU or ICANN or, or um, um, ISOC or, or anyone else. It's really about making these practical choices. Look, yes, this country needs more IXPs and this country needs more cables and, 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 and we need to set up more you know, local business that, that, um, that benefits from the um, internet. That's what it's about. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Michael and I work at a primary school here in Sweden. And uh, sometimes the kids ask me uh, who is the boss on the internet and uh, who is the major player. I mean, th they all see Google all the time and uh, some, I think most of the kids, they think that Google is like Google is the internet. Uh, how would you describe to a couple of school kids or like a, an entire class of kids uh, who runs the internet today? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I've actually had this conversation with uh, my niece and nephew who are uh, nine and seven who asked me what I did besides being a world traveler because I didn't understand what my job was, <laughs> um, which is always entertaining to explain in the car while you're driving. Um, but I think the point is that, and this is it's hard for anyone to sort of accept at face value, is no one controls the internet. There's no one single body, there's no one single stakeholder, there's no one single government. It's a decentralized network of networks and people like Yari and others make parts of it work and Jean-Jacques' organization makes parts of it work and NetNod here in Sweden. Like, that's the reality of what this is and for some people um, that's hard to accept and for governments in particular, it's challenging to accept but there is no one single party, institution or stakeholder that controls the internet. I think if you, if you think about the internet in 
in sort of you know, in a value chain or in layers, you know, you've got different points. We, you know, in the basic architecture domain name system, we're kind of at the bottom, if you will, when you go through the chain, you've got the network operators and, and you know, the people that provide you with access to the internet. And then you go up the chain, you've got the web, if you will, and then you have actors like Google and, and, and others. Um, so, you know, people are active and have got different types of, uh, of remits or influences at different levels of the chain. Um, what we have to, to try and make sure is that it's across each of the, the layers and especially at the, the key bottlenecks in between and all the layers that it's as dynamic and competitive and open as possible, you know, that there's at least the least friction as possible. Um, I mean, ideally, you know, it would be still the user that's in charge or in your particular case it should be the, the people controlling the internet should be the parents or the teacher, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> or a well-educated child. Well. Uh I'd actually bring up the term, I'd like to bring up the term ecosystem, right? Because that's one of the terms that, that uh, um, it's again one of these terms that are kind of a la mode. Uh, it, it started in the technical community and, and ISOC championed this idea of the internet being an ecosystem, right? Do you, do you want to explain? Um, now everyone uses the term ecosystem. So if you want to sound competent when you talk about internet governance, mention the word ecosystem and multi-stakeholder and Bob's your uncle. But maybe you can explain what, what, why is the internet or the internet governance model an ecosystem? Uh, because for, for, for the very simple reason, I think that it evolves in an organic way. And I think that this has been very... Uh, uh, apparent in, in, the, uh, in the past hour and a half that we have been discussing those issues that the, the, the internet is this ecosystem that e evolves organically through the, its technology and then of course you have the policy challenges that are being attached to the technology and of course then you have policies that raise uh, te uh, technology challenges so it is this um, combination, if you want, of, of various aspects that are brought together to create this bigger structure that, yes, we call ecosystem because you have plenty of organizations and plenty of actors engaging and then you have the multiplicity of issues, whether they're technical or whether they're policy or whether they're social or whether they're political. So they create this big pond, if you want, uh, that... Uh, that uh, <sighs> where all the issues meet and they need resolution. And one of the things that we need to understand is that they're not separate anymore. I mean, they're interwined to the extent that one influences the other. And going back to what uh, the gentleman asked, which I also thought was a great question, uh, there is a collective responsibility. And I think that to, to, to preserve the internet, to preserve the values of the internet, to preserve the culture of the internet, and to preserve the world that has been done, is, is being done and will be done. Because this work, again, is not separate. It's not that suddenly, you know, the new uh, wave of engineers will come in and suddenly they will set their own uh, structures and norms. This is a continuation. This is, uh, the narrative needs to continue the way it started and it needs to, you know, it is a journey that we're being taken and we all have this collective responsibility of respecting what has been done uh, because what has been done, it is very apparent that has worked and it has brought a lot of great things, it has brought a lot of challenges as well, but this is part of us trying to get to the point where uh, everybody has access because we all understand that the internet is a great vehicle and has brought more good than actual, uh, actually the challenges. Mm. Well, I, I really like the term ecosystem because I think, and especially if you explain to school kids, it's like saying, who's the boss of nature, right? You've got all these different organisms and these different systems and they're interdependent and you can't just remove one organism be without it affecting the whole ecosystem. So I think it's a really nice way of describing this, this complex internet world. Can I just ask a follow-up question then? Uh, in nature, you can have like a top predators. Eating all the Nature others. has predators. Yeah. Yes, but even there, I would argue, well, actually, maybe I shouldn't be arguing, but I would argue <laughs> <laughs> that there are, again, you never have, very rarely have a predator that just eats up the whole ecosystem, right? You've got... I think as, um, 
There's a book by uh, Tim Wu, who's one of the big the professors from uh, New York University, Columbia, um, who's a, a net neutrality expert. He wrote a book, I think, two or three years ago about the history of monopolies. And he explains how, you know, basically you have a, a company that usually starts with a great innovation or a great business model, and little by little they grow to become a monopoly. But invariably, after a while, they get tired and it might take a long time in some cases, it might take the law, etc. but they get tired and then other organizations emerge. And if you look at the internet, it goes even faster than that. I mean, I remember when, you know, I used to use Yahoo as a search engine, right? Um, in the 90s, that was the big thing. I actually, then, though others, right? Do you remember Lycos or Excite? Yes, and web crawler, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's happened. I'm not saying that things haven't evolved and that there are no risks, um, but I, I do think that, that things come to balance and uh, you know, there, are, there are trends. So I'm hoping that the ecosystem works well enough that we won't have you know, an uber domination by a, a single entity or certainly that it won't last long. That's what I'm, I'm hoping that the ecosystem can sort of self-regulate. That's, that's how it happens in nature. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll get there. And, yeah, and also, uh, you've mentioned the word predator, which I find very uh, interesting. Even in nature, when there are, the, yes, of course, there are predators, but we see, uh, we see uh, uh, creatures <laughs> gathering together in order to, 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 to fight those predators. And I think that's exactly what is happening in the Internet. When we see that there is potential danger in destroying any aspect of it, any uh, that has to do with the communication or the, the, the social aspect, the communities that really believe and in, uh, in the internet and uh, gather together in order to protect it. I mean, we saw back during the, 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 the Arab Spring, for example, when the, Egypt, the then Egypt government decided to shut the internet down, right? And suddenly w the world did not know what was happening because we were also dependent on the internet. We saw the communities being formed that they were taking the, the simple SMS messages and they were translating them into tweets. So we really actually do see that uh, when, when, the, when there is risk, we see those communities forming together in order to protect the e ecosystem. And I think this is another, uh, another one of the great things that the internet has created, this sense of communities coming together in order to uh, protect something that they consider even greater uh, than, yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I'll let Yadi and then we'll go back to the audience. Yes. Wanted to um, comment on this a little bit on the, on the predator question. I, I think it's um, maybe useful to think of um, some of these questions in terms of the you know the, the challenges or or you know possible bad out outcomes or um, things thrown in in front of us. And and there are certainly many um, re really challenging things, not just like individual cyber crime you know criminal type of acts in the internet, but also. Other worries, like I, I worry about um, fragmentation of the internet, that you know, parts of the internet get uh, sort of, you know, uh, more or less disconnected from the rest, and, and, and then there's a different reality there, and the benefits of this global communication actually diminish. And another issue is, is surveillance, surveillance that I also worry about. Um, and, you know, in all of these cases, the, I mean, it, it's, it's better, as, as, you know, the more we can discuss these and, and, and try to address them, the, the better, um, and, and just take surveillance as, as, as one example. I mean, this is not actually not a, I mean, some of us may think that that's a new thing, a r recent discussion, but it's actually something that has been going on for basically for decades. So in the 1990s, we had a big discussion um, at the ITF about, you know, can we use encryption in the internet at all? I mean, is that, should that be prohibited? And, and then a little later, um, we had a discussion whether we can use strong encryption uh, or not, and, and you know the league um, law enforcement agencies came in and said, ah, but if you use strong encryption, then we can you know decipher what the what the bad guys are doing in the internet. Um, unfortunately, we chose to do you know strong encryption and employ encryption all over the place um, in 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 the in internet protocols, and and that I think actually helped things like e-commerce evolve because if we didn't have you know security protection for our credit cards. I mean, I, I know the situation is not, per is not perfect today, but it would be far, far worse if, if we did not have that, have that protection. So I think we need to try and deal with some of these things, and we're dealing with some of these new threats as well as, as um, um, things appear. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions from the audience before I throw out any new... Okay, we have a question here. There was some of the failures. Oh, well, while we wait, I'm going to... Um... All right, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel Westman. I'm, I'm a board member of ISOC SE and a researcher at Stockholm University. Uh, I have a question on... Uh, is it meaningful, how meaningful is it to broaden the concept of internet governance? Uh, we can see the trend that everything is internet governance, uh, also on the different layers. If, if you read the outcome of the Net Mundial, for example, it's discussion and, and policy about uh, freedom of expression, copyright policy, uh, liability for intermediaries and so on. But it, it gets very vague because if, if you try to handle it in a multi-stakeholder way, it gets very vague principles and also gives the users uh, less rights than they have according to other international instruments in, in UN conventions on, on human rights and so on. Uh, is it, uh, do you understand the question? Is it meaningful to, to think that everything is internet governance or should you try to limit what is internet governance to, uh, so to speak, the more technical issues on the everyday work? Or, or is it a good thing to, to say that everything, every policy issues related to the internet is internet governance? I think it depends completely on who defines internet governance. There's a fairly complex definition in the World Summit on Information Society that everybody relates to. Um, I tend to to agree, I think, with you about, you know, narrowing the scope. And what, when I think about governance of the internet, it's more in the sense of, um, you know, how the internet works rather than fundamental principles. Um, you know, if we have fundamental principles, you cited freedom of expression. To me, basically, what is a fundamental right uh, offline should be a fundamental right online. The difference should be only in, in how you implement that because of the technology. You know, if, if I have the right to express myself, it should be the same on the internet or, uh, or offline. Um, that said, I think in a multi-stakeholder model, you could think of, of an interesting experiment in terms of how you, 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 you share ideas and perspectives and you might get to, to better policy making on a day-to-day -day basis. For, and that's what the Brazilians, for instance, tried to do. They, um, they came out with a, a legislation uh, that was actually agreed, oh, officially signed at Net Mundial in April called Marco Civil. And it was, uh, in large part, the, the, the policy was debated and, 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 and you know, bill worded by a, a multi-stakeholder structure called CGI.br. So uh, when you, you get to things like that, I, I don't think it automatically weakens uh, principles. It's, it's, it tries to put all the energy and the various perspectives together to come up with a better policy or with better regulation if you're contemplating regulation. Um, so I think the model still works, but I, I would agree that, I mean, certainly my, my understanding of internet governance is that it's, it's narrower in scope, then uh, it shouldn't sort of touch absolutely everything, ideally. So I am very much in favor of um, keeping the scope as, you know, suitable as possible or as narrow as possible, and that just makes things more efficient, that if, if everything is discussed everywhere, um, that's not very um, practical, and lots of people have to travel to lots of places, and frankly, I, I can't deal with that anymore, personally at least. Um, but um, just to give you some examples, so, so one of the things that we're doing sort of in this broader internet governance space is, is transitioning some of the US government responsibilities for oversight or stewardship of the, um, the IANA functions or the, you know, administering the names and, and numbers and protocol parameters into the international community. And we've been very strict on trying to keep that away from some of these other issues like, you know, child protection. That's a different issue. We don't have to deal with that child protection in terms of like how we assign addresses into uh, organizations as an example. And it's, it, 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 it's really very necessary to do this in order to keep this, um, you know, different topics actually alive and, and moving ahead uh, instead of connecting everything together. So I'm going to actually take a slightly different perspective and then I'll explain why. It's um, natural and it's very easy, um, especially sitting next to an engineer, to say, well, it's easy to talk about internet governance and focus on the, sort of the standards and the institutions involved, whether it's ICANN. And it's one of the reasons why ICANN and the domain name system was kind of a big focus at the World Summit on the Information Society, is that this part of the internet is one of the most notably 
coordinated and visibly accessible to people in terms of an institution. But if the idea is to take the design principles that you mentioned earlier that Bob had put forward and others, and what the IETF and others are doing about involving everybody and having a system and an ecosystem where everyone's involved, if you don't actually talk about internet policy issues, as, as part of internet governance, then you're gonna end up in a situation where only governments decide for you. And in Sweden, that's not a problem because of the way your democracy works and the way your country works. In other countries, it doesn't work that way. So um, I'm sorry for Yari and his travel schedule. Um, and, and for others, you don't always have to go to everything. We do have this internet thing, you can do things remotely. Um, but the idea of focusing only on the technical and, and making internet governance only about those component pieces, I think um, this is part of the point of actually taking the design principles of the internet and using those to solve policy problems in a meaningful way that actually lets everybody be involved. And that's kind of, I think, why, from my perspective, internet governance has always been broader than some of these technical issues and why the IGF has, has such a bit large remit depending on um, what it takes up. It's also one of the reasons why the IGF every year can evolve the topics it focuses on. So next year will be the 10th. 10th Internet Governance Forum, and if you looked at the first IGF, it very much was focused on the domain name system and some free expression stuff, um, and for the last two years, it's been about privacy and surveillance, some copyright. It allows this, the conversation to sort of evolve and flourish as need be. Okay, I want to spend the last 20 minutes focusing on the future, <clears throat> and uh, I feel like we need to at least um, explain a little bit what this NTIA, IANA stewardship transition is before we uh, move into the future, or maybe that's what will transition us into the future. Uh, and then I have a few questions uh, uh, to you about what you think the challenges of the future are. But could I ask uh, someone, I think all of you are in, involved in, in some way in this uh, IANA stewardship transition, could someone just give a very brief explanation of what it is and if it matters or if it doesn't matter at all? I think the logical person here is. <laughs> I, I, can, I can explain what we announced in, in uh, March and, and why. So uh, again, we've talked a couple of times about sort of the origins of this and from when NTI first got involved in the late 90s. But at the time, um, we were, uh, as I said, instructed um, by the White House to privatize and internationalize the management of the domain name system and did a series of consultations and looked for a stakeholder and a partner to uh, transfer what had been sort of US functions through through either contract or through research grants or whatever. ICANN was created and NTIA entered into a series of agreements with ICANN over the years. Um, one of those was uh, called the IANA Functions Contract. Um, and basically this is the updating for the most part of three registries. That's all this is, by the way. It's, it's, it's three publicly accessible registries that need to be updated to make the underpinnings of some of the domain name system work. And uh, we entered into this contract with ICANN as part of our privatization process. And when we first started, we thought the entire privatization exercise would take two years. And it took, took, took uh, 12 or 15, depending on which year you count. And then this last part. So when we announced in March was the final stage of a 16-year effort to privatize the domain name system. So um, what we, 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 we've um, said to the world and said, said to the internet community, um, we think the system is mature. We've seen great improvements in ICANN over the last two to three years. We've seen broader acceptance of the multi-stakeholder model in the international community. Keeping in mind the five years of the WISIS process, the outcome was great in terms of acceptance of this approach, but it was five long years of arguing with people to sort of um, and getting everyone to sort of agree in principle this was something worth doing. I think when we first started the WISIS conversations, there was still a d debate and concern in the world, would I can't even continue to exist? I think we've moved way beyond that debate, uh, thankfully. And so um, from our perspective, like I said, we'd seen broader acceptance of this model. We'd seen the great improvements in ICANN. And uh, this is currently the current IANA functions contract, if all the options are extended, is a seven-year contract. So the way our contracts work is we do a base period and then we have options to extend. So before we got halfway through this first ba base period, w we announced, okay, we're ready for us to finally do what we said we were gonna do 16 years ago. We're finally ready to sort of um, you know, transition our stewardship role. We established um, four key principles, which were, are the following. 
Uh, one, we would not accept a government-led or governmental solution or something that would replace us. That was kind of foundational. It's contrary to this concept of multi-stakeholder and what we've been discussing. So that was one frame of where we were. And then we established four principles. We wanted a multi-stakeholder solution developed in a multi-stakeholder process, which Yari and others can describe. We asked for a proposal that would ensure the stability and security of the domain name system would continue. We asked for a proposal that would ensure that the customers of the IANA functions, their needs would actually be met. And we asked for a proposal that would ensure a free and open internet would continue. And with that, we meant um, we've uh, administered the system in a very apolitical, neutral way. Uh, content has not been impacted and free expression has been preserved. And with that, we said to the international community you, you, and, and the, the um, internet, internet technical community, you're the folks that work in the system, design a proposal and come back to us. And um, we're very pleased that what, how people have taken up this process. And I, I know it's been a lot of work for a lot of people in addition to their day jobs. Um, but we're very confident and we're very hopeful that we're going to be able to you know, um, do, do this transition and do it in a way that's going to make sense for people around the world. Thank you. You've explained this before, I can hear. <laughs> Yari, please. Yeah, so just uh, one observation there, and then, you know, um, after the announcement, everyone, of course, you know, start, you know, realized, oh, okay, the U.S. government is you know, doing these things, and now, now it's moving somewhere else, and you know, where do we put that? And what, um, actually, of course, then the search for, you know, what, what is it exactly that the U.S. government did, and, and that, I think, occasionally has led us into like the wrong path of thinking, because ultimately what, what they were doing, at least from our perspective at the IETF, was that, that, you know, that they had created the system and had the foresight to let the system grow and, and develop, and you know, all of these good things happen at ICANN, IETF, and other, other parts of the system, and you know, keep the hands up. That's the oversight, that, that, that's the stewardship that they had, and, and now, we're starting to be strong enough to do this on our own, and that we're, we're moving to that, or sort of recognizing that state of affairs, r rather than moving a particular function or, or activity into something new. So is this a, a quick question before we move on to, to the next thing. Is, is this important? It is, it is 10 TIA. I'm not sure it's important <laughs> to the average, average user. Um, and, and Some people say, there's not, not much to see here, move along. And, and others say, this is the biggest thing since, I don't know, sliced bread. I, I, I think it's very important if we screw it up. Right? Yes. Everyone's going to notice, <laughs> right? right? Um, and, but we won't, right? So, yes. so that, that, that's going to be OK. I, I think that the real reason why this is being done, not because something is done badly. I mean, it, it runs great. I mean, ICANN is doing great work for us, running the IANA part of um, um, the, the operation the database and, and everything else. And the US government is doing their role. Um, so everything's running great. But, but if we make this change, the internet will be, or the structure of the internet and the administration of the internet will be even more distributed and even more in the hands of the multi-stakeholder community. And that means it's going to be stronger when something bad happens in the future. So I think that's why we're doing this. We're doing this for the next 20 years or, or 50 years to, to be stronger. So that's the reason. And, and it does matter. Nice, nice explanation. Uh, Did you want to add to that? Yes. And it is important because it is a great opportunity. This is, you know, I think that Fiona put it really nicely when she said, you know, uh, originally the, the, the white and green paper were mentioning two years of oversight, and right now, you know, we are 16 years down the road, but the, the NTIA felt that the system was mature. Uh, in 2005, multi-stakeholder was a word written in a UN document. Right now, we are in a place where we understand more what it stands for and uh, why we need to preserve it, and this, what the NTIA is doing, is a, a testament to this model. Attaching also those criteria makes it even more important because this is something that we have all been discussing, the openness of the internet, the security, stability, and resiliency, and actually right now it is right in front of us. And what we're being told is you're responsible enough to carry on this. And this is why it is important because we, we have, we are given the opportunity, the Indian community and uh, all these people that are participating are given the opportunity to prove that yes, we can do this. We've got this and it is about time that, you know, we are taking, we are responsible enough to carry on uh, these functions in the future. Right, thank you. All right, well, just 
So, the, the last, last part of the session, let's focus on, on the future. So, I'd like to ask you two questions. One is, um, the, the topics that dominate current internet governance discussions, are they the right ones? If not, what do you think they should be focusing on instead? And then the second question is, what are the greatest challenges that we have ahead of us in terms of internet governance? No particular order. Whoever feels inspired. So I think if you're thinking about the institutional level, um, the way that the entire system of internet governance is evolving is, is oh, maybe challenges, maybe uh, too negative, but it's, it's the exciting thing. Um, you know, there's this INA transition, it's this important symbol of the fact that now the internet community is just getting on with it and, and taking the decisions of its own. This multi stakeholder model is moving forwards. And then there's a wider evolution of internet governance, which uh, was reiterated in particular at this Net Mundial conference, which is about you know, taking the internet governance forum to the next level um, and trying to address any other major international issue to do with internet governance in a more maybe systematic uh, manner. So I think that that's going to occupy a lot of our time uh, over the next few years. So that's on the institutional front. Then, depending again on how you define internet governance, uh, you know, if you go down into internet policies, I think you know there are clearly a few issues that will continue to occupy our time for the, the foreseeable future. I think uh, how we handle uh, data, uh, both from a you know, positive perspective, how we enable development of the cloud, how we use big data for positive causes, as much as the you know the, the more worrisome aspects, how we protect our personal data. That's going to remain an issue. How we have international um, norms, if you will, for, for how data exchanges uh, happen. It's going to be a big question for a while, I think. Uh, we have questioned about open access to the internet in, in various ways. Uh, so it goes from things like net neutrality to a wider concept of how you preserve the end-to-end -end principle, you, how you keep the internet unique and global in that sense, how you ensure that any user can connect to any other user of the internet worldwide, I think that's going to remain uh, amongst the topics that we, we have to, to keep an eye on. Um, so yeah, I think um, uh, privacy, uh, sort of competition across the value chain, and, just, and generally overall as a, so you've got the institutional development and then at the sort of policy level, it's again, you know, how we make sure that we continue to, to have an internet that develops so that we can reap the most economic and social benefits and individual benefits from it. How we harness that wonderful tool. And I, I think we're, we're, we're just, We've just seen the tip of the iceberg. We have so much more that the internet can deliver for the world. And I think now it's about you know, sharing good experiences and making the most of it. So there's a, a lot of exciting things happening, um, but always more we can do. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think the short-term things, you know, the INA transition, we have to succeed with that. Uh, we ha have to do more for privacy. We have to deploy the internet for the rest of the people on the planet. You know, all, all of those things that we discussed uh, today, I mean, really, really key. Um, and lots of work going on there, so, so that's good. I'm, I'm optimistic again. Um, a little long term, I, I think I'd, I'd make the observation that it tends to be the case that like in, in the development of the internet, for instance, the, all the structures for thinking about the governance or the policies just sort of came you know, long after the internet was, was created. And I think that trend seems to be continuing. So now when we're debating, um, you know, all kinds of topics, let's say, um, um, you know, uh, some governments are debating whether there should be dot Patagonia or dot wine or, you know, whatever um, um, uh, domain names. Um, and, and they think that's an important thing. And it, it is, but um, in, in some sense, it, to me, it appears like the internet is moving forward a little bit, and the users are like, you know, what, you know dot what, and um, uh, they, they actually care more about, you know, what what's going on with their Twitter hashtags or Facebook groups or whatever. So, so I think the internet is evolving, um, and it's not just like the user human uh, aspect of it. It's also that we're going to get uh, the internet of things, which, you know, ten times or hundred times or thousand times more devices and very different policy issues than than the you know. The, Humans browsing something, or, or you know, um, uh, children uh, being uh, stalked in the in the network, or something like that. So, so it, it, the whole whole scene is changing, and we have to stop at times and think about this change, and, and be sure that we're still dealing with uh, relevant things.
So I think um, we've spent a lot of time, in, at least in the sort of internet governance discussions globally, uh, for the last 15 years debating and discussing the arrangements and institutional arrangements of, of the internet. And I think the Siena transition, obviously an important piece. Um, but I do think we're moving into a new phase. Um, and I think the next phase of sort of global discussions around these issues really gets more of user needs and really gets at content issues. And I think that's more of the trend of, of the conversation going forward. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges probably facing the internet is the role of intermediaries and what the liability or opportunity is for intermediaries as you see the online world and the offline world um, sort of clash a little bit in terms of copyright, in terms of law enforcement, in terms of access, um, and at the same time free expression. So I think the role of, role of intermediaries, and this will be a topic for you, I'm sure, the role of intermediaries will be the big topic for the future. Um, I, w I would point out, um, I read a, a great book of, of many years ago called The Victorian Internet, and it's a, it's a very short book, and I'd highly recommend it to you, but it's basically uh, about the history of the telegraph. And you can read this 100-page little book about the telegraph and all the policy issues that evolve with the, pel the telegraph are the same ones we're talking about today. So I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not sure if the issues are going to change much over time. But. Uh, I, w I think that uh, bringing in the, th uh, the next 3 billion uh, people online is, is a challenge, not because we just want to bring them in. We want to bring them in and allow them to have exactly the same uh, uh, possibilities that everybody else had on the internet. So we bring them in and we continue to, to, to tell them that the internet is open, they can do great things. So we don't bring them in on the basis of, oh, you're able to access the internet through specific services, y y through Facebook, for example, or uh, et cetera. So this is, I think, one of uh, the big challenges at an institutional level is how we will be able um, to actually bring even closer uh, and allow the stakeholders, the different stakeholders to cooperate together and learn from one another and exchange information and knowledge in a way that will allow the internet to continue uh, to surprise us the way it has done and not get intimidated by the next big thing that is coming or the next big technology that the internet is bringing rather than all gather to, uh, to find a solution. And I actually think that the IANA transition process is a very positive step towards this uh, collaborative spirit and in bringing communities and people together and learning from one another as to how processes have been made, consensus is reached, and how we can help the internet evolve and be sustained. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that brings us to, to the end. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let you all make a, a, a final comment. Uh, but I'll first take us back to John Pistel, who's, um, again, by many described as, as the father of the internet. There are apparently many fathers. I'm not sure how this, uh, <laughs> how this actually happened. But um, he was by, by someone described as the god of the internet uh, in an article. And, and uh, um, he says, uh, or he said, uh, I think they call me to the closest thing to a god of the internet. But at the end, the article wasn't very complimentary because the author suggested that I wasn't doing a very good job and that I ought to be replaced by a professional. Of course, there isn't a god of the internet. The internet works because a lot of people cooperate to do things together. The internet should not be managed by any government, national or multinational. So this was back in the um, early 90s. Um, and I think this also inspired, actually, the Tao of the IETF, which says, uh, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. So I'd like to ask you, are these principles that you think will hold into the future? We're talking about not just next generation, but the next generation after that. Um, and if there are any other final comments you'd like to make. So, yes. In, in the context of these principles, whether they will, be, uh, they will be retained, I think we need to make sure that they are retained because it is these principles that keep the engine going and keep the engine growing. And the only thing that I would say is get involved, get interested, and uh, be part of this discussion. It is very important that the more people get in, the more voices there are, and the more we are going to uh, be able and understand and perhaps find solutions to the challenges that lie ahead of us. Thank you.
So um, I think, as, as we've sort of said, alluded to directly or indirectly, from our perspective in, in the U.S. government, while all what we've been doing, or at least what I've been doing for the last 14 years, is doing all these great steps and efforts to preserve what John talked about and what others have done, which is to actually take the design principles of the Internet and move it into a governance regime. And it's been hard, right? I mean, we've been talking here about the great success of it. It's been really hard. Um, and I think the only way that it continues is if people get involved. You have events like this, and you guys demand this, and you get involved, and, and you do things. Um, in, at, in the United States, you know, we, we are very much involved at NTI with ICANN, with Internet Governance Forum. We've tried to d deploy this domestically um, with development of multi-stakeholder codes of conduct for privacy. Um, and we're doing our best to sort of um, not just talk about it, but actually live it. But it takes a lot of energy, work, and commitment. And it takes a user base and a citizenry that demands it. So I would just encourage you guys to get involved and continue to make sure that it happens here. Thank you. So I wanted to go back to rough consensus and running code, which I, of course, believe in very much, and um, talk about the running code part. And um, we, when we work with technical standards, we fail if we don't have that running code. If we do some uh, something that doesn't have, or doesn't result in running code, uh, or we even when we do something that is not informed by running code, we usually fail. And I, I think that's something to think about also for some of these uh, policy questions that um, it only matters if it actually has a real impact in the world and is, is um, encoded in what different entities in the world actually do with the internet. So you know, maybe that is something to be um, kept in mind. Thank you. I would say I keep it concrete. That's always a challenge. I agree. Um, I, I think those principles are, are, are wonderful guidance. Um, you know, talked about the fathers of the internet and uh, some of them are still around. There were a, a team, uh, actually several teams. And, um, you know, talking to some of them today, what is inspiring is that when they talk about when they created it, they wanted this openness built into the system. They wanted any person, any device to be able to connect to it and they wanted this network to be distributed. And they wanted its development and its general way of, of being to be collaborative. And it was, yes, a team at the University of Southern California that was the main team developing it, but actually in developing the internet, they actually also consulted with many other research teams. They saw collaboration as an essential way of making the network, uh, of getting the network born and, 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 and evolving in the right manner. And I think this openness, this distribution, this sharing and this collaboration that's in built in a network that's become, you know, this, this tool that finally interconnects the world. And we've never had that in human history. It's got immense potential and it's based upon this, upon this openness and upon, upon this collaboration. And I think we have to preserve it because it's important for mankind, frankly. Um, I know it sounds a bit big, but it's true. Um, and so I'd say, I'd just finish like Konstantinos to say, I mean, one of the chances we have and you have, uh, all of us have in this room is that the processes that we're talking about are all open and each of us as individuals or as representatives of our respective organizations, we each have a role and we have a seat at the table according to our competencies and our interests. So do get involved. You can come and participate in ICANN policy making. You can come and, and attend ITF. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure we can teach you coding. Um, you know, but do come in, do get involved and at, at national or international, get your voice heard. Feed that back to the politicians and others. Um, make them understand what really matters. You know, get the voice of the user out there. It's, 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 uh, I think it's important for every single one of us. Lovely. Well, thank you very much. I think with those words, I think we'll say thank you to our eminent pa panel. And uh, thank you to all of you in the room, both those of you who've, of you who've asked questions and, and those of you who listened attentively. So thank you very much. <laughs>